Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. We're still in that section which is basically a pause in the flow in, of the events of the book where John will highlight <clears throat> three chapters which deal with one, chapter 12, the Antichrist, I'm sorry, uh, Satan the dragon, who persecutes the woman Israel. So that chapter is about Satan persecuting the nation Israel in that future seven-year period known as Daniel's 70th week from Daniel 9, 27, and also a time of Jacob's trouble or distress from Jeremiah 30. But Jeremiah 30 said uh, Jacob will be delivered from it. So Jesus Christ will return and deliver his people into the Messianic kingdom. Chapter 13 deals with I think the revived Roman Empire, and also highlighting the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. The first half of the chapter is dealing with the Antichrist. The second half of the chapter is dealing with the false prophet. Two central figures um, Satan will use to persecute not just Israel, but also hold down and oppress the people of the world. And they'll actually worship the Antichrist through the miracles of the false prophet. And then chapter 14, you'll see six scenes of hope, uh, looking to the future as Revelation 11 did. Chapter 12 says the kingdom has come, but it hasn't come. But it's on the horizon. It's almost there, this legal transfer, looking as as if the kingdom has already been established, but it's just three and a half years uh, down the road. Revelation 11, 15, 12, 10. There's even a picture of the 144,000 in Zion. And I think that's the millennial Zion. I know there's the heavenly Zion view. But I think he's giving you a foretaste. They will be in the land. Jesus will be ruling in Zion from the millennial temple. And those 144,000 Jewish people from the 12 tribes of Israel will be sealed and protected. And they will be glorified in the future. So you see these scenes of hope, which we do need as you read Revelation. People say, I like to hear those because you read Revelation 6 through 19 and you see a lot of disaster and suffering. So we've been looking at the many examples in the book of Revelation that reveal the suffering and persecution of believers and their call to endure trials. The verse that led me to focus on suffering is a just a a short series of now three lessons, including today, was Revelation 13.10, a verse clearly dealing with the suffering of believers for their faith in Christ during the tribulation. Verse 10 says, if anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. Anyone kills with the sword, to the sword he will be killed. And here is the perseverance and the faith of the holy ones, the believers, saints, um, believers that will be persecuted in that future time are called to persevere for their faith. So we have focused on the sufferings of Christ because we've been talking about suffering. So my first lesson two weeks ago was to really focus on Christ, the ultimate sufferer, to put it into that proper perspective. He's the highest example of suffering, so I wanted to start at the top. And that will help give us that temporary perspective that we deal with of the sufferings of life that we deal with now. Then, the next week, we started looking, and I highlight some of the reasons. Some of the reasons revealed in the Bible concerning why believers suffer in this world. So we covered six, and I told you at the end of 2 Peter, I did a three-week or maybe a four-week lesson plan on that and covered a lot more. In more detail, you can go back and look at that. I'm trying to be a little more brief so I don't stay out of Revelation too long. But we've looked at at six reasons so far, and now I want to pick up with verse, uh, sorry, number seven. So a seventh reason I see in the Bible why we suffer is to bring glory to God. And this is often designed to bring others to the Lord. One of my, there's so many examples you could use. One of my favorites is in the Gospel of John, chapter 9. So go ahead and turn there. 
We won't cover the whole chapter. When I went through this in the Second Peter study, I went through the whole chapter with you. But just turn to John 9. So the Old Testament had predicted this coming Messiah, and, and Jesus Christ shows up as that predicted Messiah. And one of the ways the Messiah was to be tested, according to the Old Testament, was what he does, his works, and also his words. Remember Deuteronomy 18? God said, I'll send a prophet like you, Moses, one from among your brethren. So he has to be Jewish, and you must listen to him. So you're going to judge the Messiah based on if he's the greater Moses, then his words have to line up with the Old Testament. Everything Jesus said lined up with the Old Testament. And then his, his deeds would validate his message. And so he would do miracles. Isaiah 35 said when Messiah comes, you know, the, the blind will see, the lame will leap like a deer. And what is he doing? He's healing blind people. The lame are leaping like a deer. He's, he's healing people to show his messianic credentials. So here's a great one in John 9. Uh, if you look at, oh, sorry, the whole chapter is the miracle is 1 through 7. 8 through 34, they call in the witnesses because this guy is healed from blindness and everyone's like, no way, this didn't happen. Is this really the man that was born blind? So they call his parents in and his parents say, yeah, that's our son and he was born blind, but how he received his sight, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age. Remember that? Well, they said they were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. They knew who he was. They believed in who he was. But if they say anything out loud, they're, they're, they're oust from the Jewish synagogue. And in that day, that would have been a horrible thing. Where do you go? So they call in the witnesses. And, of course, the Pharisees didn't like the testimony of the guy that was healed. And then there's the response in 935 through 41. So let's just look at a couple of verses out of this. In 9, 1, and 2, I'm going to show you why suffering can be for the glory of God. As he passed by, he, Jesus, saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Well, Jesus basically says neither. You got it wrong on both accounts. It wasn't him and it wasn't his parents. And some misuse, well, it's the parents because they go to Exodus 20 and how God will punish the third and fourth generation, like there's this generational curse, so if your parents are bad, you get whacked. It's not what that's teaching. If you keep reading the Hebrew, it says, on those who hate me. So if each generation repeats the sin of their parents, then he'll keep judging. It's not that their dad failed, so that child gets blamed for his bad de- the bad decisions of the parents. That's not what he's saying. So that doesn't work here. Um, And then you had the theology of Deuteronomy 28, when Israel sinned, God would punish the people. And it's not that. It's neither one. He didn't sin. And I'm not going to go into all the details of how he could have sinned before he was born and all that. But here's Jesus' response. It was neither this man who sinned nor his parents. So the disciples were wrong. Have you ever been wrong about what you said about somebody's suffering? Maybe we better hold our tongue a little bit before we start analyzing the lives of others. How about Job's friends? They were wrong when Job was suffering. And you find out at the end of the book, oh, God was going to judge them, right, (laughs) for their bad counsel. So be careful on how you assess the suffering of others. I'm putting options out there that may be helpful to you. But Jesus said it was neither, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, if I do this, it'll show you who I am. Or if, when I heal him, it'll d- uh, bring the glory to God because Jesus will be shown for who he is. But it's for the glory of God, right? Is that clear? Okay, now, you look at this and you think, well, sometimes in God's plan, he allows, or directly, because there's places where it's both, allows or directly causes physical suffering to manifest his works to bring glory to himself. Matthew Henry said, we must take heed of judging any to be great sinners merely because they're great sufferers, lest we be found not only persecuting those whom God has smitten, Psalm 69, 26, but accusing those whom he has justified. 
and condemning those for whom Christ died, which is daring and dangerous. So we know in the text, Jesus will heal the blind man. Remember, he puts the mud on his eyes and then says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he goes and he comes back seeing physically. Then in 9, 8 through 34, they call in the witnesses. The religious leaders bring in the witnesses, including the healed blind man, to verify if this man was really blind and to verify this miracle. And, of course, the parents acknowledge that's their son. Clearly, he's healed. And then 935 through 41, you have the response to the healing. So the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Israel, reject Christ, but the healed man believes in him. So look at 935. So Jesus hears that they put this man out of the synagogue, which was a terrible situation in that day. It didn't like here where you just go to another church in 20 20 blocks, right? Or right down the corner, I'll just go somewhere else. It didn't work that way. So they kick him out and Jesus finds this man and he said, do you believe in the son of man? Picking on the title from Daniel 9, uh, 7, I'm sorry, Daniel 7, 13 and 14, And he answered and said, well, who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And he said to him, you have both seen him. Remember, he heard him before, but he healed his eyes. Now you see me, and he is the one talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. So Jesus is not God. That is idolatry. You don't worship a creature. And this man believes in the Lord and then worships him. And then, of course, the Pharisees say, are we blind too? And he says, basically, in a very difficult statement, you're not physically blind, but you're spiritually blind, right? Otherwise, you'd see and understand who I am, Isaiah 6, 9 and 10. So the work of healing this blind man would demonstrate the glory of God, namely that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that He is the only one who can bring spiritual sight out of spiritual blindness, which is what Isaiah 6, 9, and 10 predicted. If Israel would return to the, to the Lord, he would heal them, and he would remove their blindness. So that's definitely an Isaiah 6 connection. So again, why do we suffer? Well, one category, to bring glory to God as he manifests his power through the sufferer with the desire of bringing men to himself. Now, could he do that with us today in all kinds of ways? Say yes. Now, I, I don't know what he's doing with you. And you may be saying, well, maybe I sinned. Maybe it was my dad. We're always blaming somebody, and God may be saying, this is for a glory you don't even understand. Now, will we see it on this side of heaven? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe on the other side, we'll get some answers as to why we suffered, and then we'll think, oh, I shouldn't have complained so much. Is maybe five people will be standing there who came to faith in Christ because of that. Hey, I complain with the best of them, okay? I think I wrote the book on it. I'll preach it, and then by Wednesday, I'm complaining about something. But none of you, right? Well, the smile's on your face. You're giving it away. But it's not good, right? Do nothing with complaining. Um, It's amazing how that sin almost gets excused. But there's no excuse. So again, why do we suffer? To bring glory to God. Suffering also... Sorry, I was supposed to have more up there. Um, Excuse me. Suffering also teaches us to trust God and be content with the circumstances. Inner peace or stability in the midst of trial and tribulation. Do you need this? This is one I really want. Because sometimes when pressure comes, you really see where you are. And sometimes I've seen that in my life going, Lord, I want to be better than this. Because who knows what suffering is getting ready to happen, not just to this world as it is happening, but to this country. And I want to be really prepared. I want to be prepared for death. So that when I'm lying on my deathbed, if I get to lie there, you know, and have a chance to think about it. And think, I'm getting ready to go through the door of God's and into His presence. And what a wonderful thing that's going to be. And instead of being all down in the mouth about what I'm experiencing. So here's another reason. It teaches us to trust God and be content with whatever the circumstances. 
So suffering can teach us to have an inner stability in the midst of trial and tribulation. I, I think of military guys, and there's some in the room that have probably trained, but if you're getting ready to go into a battle situation, they don't, take, they don't want to take a brand new guy off the streets who's never fired a weapon and say, we're sending you over there today. Now they want to give him some time, and they want to simulate battle, right? Noises, bombs going off, the sound of ammo, and other uh, guys on your own team playing the enemy in the, in the drill. But they want to get you prepared for what you're probably never going to be fully prepared for. So we need to be trained that way for what could be coming. And I think we need to go through this with a divine perspective. So here's a good one for this suffering to teach us to be content. Uh, Philippians 4. What the Apostle Paul said as he closed this letter, he says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Do you see a word there that's important? I've learned. Did he say, well, I got saved and it was automatic? No, I have to learn. You have to learn this. So I, had to, I have learned to be content with the circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. So let's see the contrast. I have and I don't have. In any and every circumstance, again, I have learned, I have learned the secret of being, con, of being filled and going hungry, of both having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Him, Christ, who strengthens me. So Paul was a Jewish Pharisee, and an amazing one, from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, he says. So he's probably saying, I'm a Hebrew-speaking Jew, a Roman citizen, and a Pharisee high up on the spiritual ladder. And when he came to Christ, his own people turned on him. And now he's going through suffering. Remember what, he to what God told him on the Damascus Road after his conversion? Now you're going to see how you're going to suffer for me, the one you've been persecuting. And so Paul goes through all this persecution. And over time, he learned all of this, right? Just read 2 Corinthians 11. Read his resume of suffering, of what this man went through in that long paragraph, and you'll see it. So learning with understanding in the spiritual life takes time. Even while we're under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So contentment in various circumstances is not automatic simply from being saved or becoming a child of God. And did you notice something? We're to be, we learn to be content even in times of what? Not just suffering. Prosperity. Oh, I want that one. That's not suffering. And Well, you have to learn to be content in suffering lack and also in prosperity. So I think we need to remember that sometimes passing the prosperity test is one of the most difficult tests in life. Everyone wants wealth, and when they get it, their life falls apart. Everybody wants their wealth, and they lose all their friends because they're not giving everybody a car. None of you have won the lottery, right? I haven't either, but I've heard the stories. And we think that prosperity in and of itself will bring happiness, and we find it doesn't. Some of the most unhappy people are wealthy people. And then some are very happy because they have capacity for it. Some are never content with the wealth they have because they just simply will never get enough. And I'm not against making money and people who have a good job and are ambitious and have big companies. Good, good for you. And they provide, the Lord provides for them and other people under them and all that. But I'm, what I'm saying is some people are never satisfied with the wealth. They just can't get enough. And as Paul told Timothy, those who long for it have pierced themselves with many griefs. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So you can run into that problem. So as Paul went through times of suffering as he walked with Christ, over time, it taught him to be content no matter the situation and kept him focused on Christ who strengthened and sustained him. So to get there, I guess we have to go through suffering, right? Are you praying to get some? You don't have to, it just seems to show up. But would it be wrong to pray for suffering to grow you? I don't think so. 
It's a bold prayer. <laughs> but could you accuse somebody of being ungodly? I don't think so. Well, number nine, we suffer in the temporal now to obtain an eternal perspective. Go to 2 Corinthians 4. I'm trying to be brief with each point, and I know that's very hard for me. Um, 2 Corinthians 4. We'll start in verse 7 just to pick up the affliction and persecution. And by the way, most of the suffering in the Bible you'll see that Christians go through that we're called to endure is persecution for your faith. I think the majority is that. So in verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be from God and not from ourselves. Now watch all these words for suffering. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Well, who is not forsaking them? Christ. He's, He's hanging in there with them through the suffering, but He's allowing it. Always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. See, persecution through martyrdom. So that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you, talking to the Corinthians. But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, and therefore we speak. The apostles speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us with Jesus and will present us with you. Huh. So the Corinthians and the apostles will one day experience bodily resurrection through the resurrected Christ. Isn't that a nice... See, in the midst of suffering, what is he saying? Eternal perspective. Because something much greater is coming down the road. So remember John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who lives and believes in me will never die. So he's eternal God become flesh. He dies on the cross for our sins. If you believe in him, you will live. Remember, Lazarus had died. And he asked, and Martha said, well, I, um, I know he'll be raised on the last day. Probably understands Daniel 12, which said there is a resurrection to come. Isaiah 26, 19, other, pla- other pa- uh, passages. And then he says, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you'll live even if you die. So 2 Corinthians 4.15, And all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we don't lose heart, but but though our outer man is decaying. Amen? All those young kids that left have no idea. (laughs) They leave with their bodies of rubber that can fall off buildings and just get up and go, I'm okay, you know what I'm saying? And then you start aging and you realize this physical vehicle we have, it'll be resurrected, but this isn't it yet. And it is decaying, but our inner man is being renewed day by day because the Bible says we have a soul and a spirit, not just a physical body, so the immaterial spirit is being renewed. And then verse 17, here it is, the eternal perspective through momentary suffering. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. So verse 17 mentions affliction. Do you have affliction? Not do you have it, but do you have it in your translation? It's the word thlepsis. It's the word used for the tribulation period of the seven years of Daniel's 70th week. Uh, affliction, tribulation. It's used by Jesus in John 16, when he says, In this world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. So this is affliction in a general sense. Through many trials and afflictions, we must enter the kingdom of God, Acts 14, 23. But notice what he says about affliction, two things. Did you catch it? Momentary and light. Momentary, parotika, 
Paraartika is a Greek word that means momentary or transient. So what's one good thing about affliction? It's temporary. <laughs> it doesn't go on forever. Number two, it's called light. Not like sunlight, but light like in weight. Elaphros. Elaphros is a Greek word that means light, something not heavy or burdensome. And then, I hate to say it, easy to bear. Walk a mile in my shoes, people say, and tell me about suffering. Who did walk a mile in your shoes and beyond? Yeah, tell him about suffering. So, before I go to verse 18, which is instrumental... Well, let me go to there. No, hold on. It's, okay, the momentary, we love that. It's not going to last. Not forever. It may go a long time, but it will come to an end eventually. It's that light thing that gets people. How can you tell me it's light or not heavy or easy to bear? And I know some people have gone through suffering. I have no frame of reference for it. It is so, it is so bad. What some are born with, what some get later, um, I haven't suffered like that. But listen to what God is saying because it's light compared to something. It's momentary compared to something, verse 18. So momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison while we look not at the things which are seen. Do you have while? Yeah, that word while. This participle is adverbial in the language which is a temporal idea, maybe. It could be a causal participle, which I go with, because we don't contemplate or because we don't look. Do you see why it can be momentary light affliction? Because you're not looking at something, but you're looking at something else. So it can only be momentary light affliction for the believer because we don't look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. So how in the world can we look at something eternal? We can't with our physical eyes. Can you see eternity? Did you take a, a, a cell phone picture? I want to see that. How do you see? What does see often mean? Perceive. How do you perceive the future? Faith in the word that is revealed. You can't just say, I believe. Believe what? Well, God has told you, Bible prophecy, over and over, what's beyond the grave. You know how many people don't even believe there's life beyond death? What a trick of the devil. You don't even think you're going to exist beyond the grave? You better wake up because there is an eternal destiny for the believer in Christ with the Lord. The unbeliever goes to the lake of fire. And I don't like that, but it's what it says because you didn't accept the only way of escape from your sin, and we're all sinners. So if you are a believer in Christ, you'll have, you'll have momentary light affliction, and it'll be light as long as you look at the eternal and light, or look at the temporal and light of eternal. And it's real easy to do that for 20 years, and then you can get your eyes off the eternal and you fall apart, just like you did 20 years ago. So you, do you have to continue to do this? Yes. And I've met a lot of Christians that have fallen away and then eventually came back and they lost sight of it. As Peter said, you can even forget your former cleansing from your past sins. You can walk so carnally with outside of God. So another one for this, Romans 8.18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed to us. So a comparison again, right? Present suffering... Eternal glory, it takes the sting off if you know the eternal perspective. So these two passages are great to encourage us to adopt an eternal perspective of life and also show that all suffering is temporary. And there's a lot of people, you'll hear them say, I don't like to go to churches where they teach prophecy. Well, where, where's the eternal perspective? In Bible prophecy. I mean... So you'd cut, what, a third of the Bible out, or maybe more. I don't know what the percentage would be if you took out all prophetic revelation um, and how that was designed by God to give us 
an, inter- an eternal perspective that brings us temporary relief through what we face now. So here's number 10. Suffering prepares us to meet the Lord more readily and keep us from being so attached to this world. Um, it helps us to stay focused on the eternal rather than the temporal, kind of dovetailing off for, uh, number nine. And this may be more of a deduction from Scripture. You know, sometimes we get so focused on our lives this side of heaven, our, our possessions, our temporary goals, which some are fine, uh, our earthly pleasures, and there's many that are in and of themselves fine, some aren't. But sometimes we just got, get so uh, worried about these things and so into those, we tend to want to stay in this life and never leave it. I can't leave my new boat. I just bought it. Is that your perspective? And some will be that way. I just built a house or something, and now's not the time to go. And we get so focused on our stuff that we never want to leave. But to me, this is a true point. Suffering has made me want to go to the Lord more, and I'm more ready. Doesn't that ever do that to you at all? You just, you're so ready to meet Him and, and, and be out of the suffering. So the Bible is very clear that life is very temporal, very, very temporary. Uh, I love, sorry, I love um, Ecclesiastes. I don't understand half the poetry in it. It's very hard to understand. Um, but Solomon was the son of David, and he wrote Ecclesiastes. Uh, verse 1 tells us that. He calls him Koheleth in Hebrew, the preacher. Uh, but in 1 2, he says, Havel, Havalim, Amar, Koheleth. Havel, Havalim, Hakol, Havel. Uh, which is vanity of vanities, a superlative in the Hebrew, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, hakol havel, all is vanity. Now, the word hevel can mean vanity, something futile, but it also can mean breath or vapor. So what is life? How long is it? It's like a vapor. You go out on a cold day and breathe, and what happens to that? You see that mist, and then where does it go? It vanishes. So I think there's the, this vapor idea for the temporary existence of life is there, but also the futility and vanity of life independent of God. Because what's it all for if God's not the center? As he closes in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, uh, Sof Devar, when all has been concluded, fear God, keep his commandments, keys the coal ha'adam, this is the entirety of our humanity. Wow, fear God and keep His commandments. That was the whole meaning of life. That's what we were here for. It wasn't the temporal stuff, was it? And He may have blessed you with wealth. Fine, that's only a, a temporary peripheral thing. So James, bringing in this vapor idea, James, the half-brother of Jesus, do you think he was Jewish? Look what he says, coming out of Ecclesiastes, I think. He says, you know that, uh, James 4.14, don't you know that your life, you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow, do you? Watch the weatherman. It's the only job in town where you can do a bad job and still get paid. <laughs> How many times they say we get rain this week, and you watch the radar, and it gets right to Houston and goes, Bloo! and now we'll have 99 degrees, and watch now a hurricane will come and give us rain. But he says, you are just a vapor. It doesn't mean you don't exist after death. He's just saying your life here is short. That appears for a little while and vanishes away. So the word vapor is an atmis, steam, mist, vapor, exhalation. Just like when you breathe on a cold day. So life is short. And James is saying that if life is temporary, focus on the Lord, the theology of the book. Uh, back to Ecclesiastes 5.15. You ever heard you can't take it with you? Ecclesiastes, Solomon wrote that. As he has come naked from his mother's womb, he will return as he came. Are you going to, they may bury you in your clothes, but you get the idea. You go back to the dust. He'll take, no, he'll take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his own hand. Of course, Jesus does parables off this. Remember the wealthy man in Luke? who built the barns to store all of his stuff. And he goes, well, tonight your life's required of you. You're coming home. Now who's going to take what you've owned on earth? So is the man who doesn't put his focus on God. 
um, 1 John 2, 15 through 17, Don't, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. The world is going to last forever. Hey, even that new car, it, you don't mind the, the high payment in month three or four, but when it loses the new car smell and you're year four now and your payments, the car isn't quite the same, is it? Toys that kids had at Christmas Bug, bug their parents for a year to get it. Three years later, it's up at the curb waiting for the trash. We get tired of stuff. The world's passing away. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. And then go to Philippians 1. I've got to watch my time. Now, Paul, with all the suffering he had, in Philippians 1, he says, we'll see it. He said it would be far better to be with God than remaining on this, this earth. Do you agree? Of course. But how did he get that attitude? I think from the experiences of life as he walked with God from his, and from his knowledge of the Bible about God and his eternal plan. Philippians 1.21, Paul says, For to me to live is Christ. To live is Christ, a person. To die is gain. He finally got to the point where, hey, if I die, I go to him. Is that gain or keratos? Gain or something of great advantage? If I'm to live on in the flesh, meaning in this present body that he said is, is decaying in, in the second book of Corinthians, this will mean fruitful labor for me for I don't know which to choose. I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. The language there is very strong, far better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. In other words, there's ministry that God's called me to do. And I tell you, a man like Paul, with who he was and his background, his knowledge of the Old Testament, and now his knowledge and direct teaching from the Lord, putting that all together... This man doesn't grow on trees, right? He's a good representative of God that can do great things on earth. So he doesn't know which way to go, but he says, if I stay on for you, it'll help. Convinced of this, I know that I'll remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy in the faith, the word, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ. See, he, Christ gets the glory through my coming again to you. So number 11, we suffer as Christians. Well, back to that other point, I guess Paul chose a little more suffering, right, for the benefit of people. And then God will bring him home when it's his time, and we know he did. Nero had his head cut off eventually. You want to read the attitude of a dying man waiting for his head to be cut off? Read 2 Timothy. That was what was going through his mind before he died. Amazing. Amazing. Number 11, we suffer as Christians if we choose to identify with Christ in this fallen world ruled by Satan. Remember what Jesus said when he walked the earth, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So, hey, if you're hated for your faith in him, he says, I'm the son of God. I got hated by even my own people, and I got hated by Gentiles. I mean, was Pilate a Gentile? And uh, there were plenty of Gentiles that hated him too. But he says, remember, it hated me first. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, and I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. We don't usually do that in the gospel presentation. Believe in Jesus, you'll have eternal life. Oh, and guess what? You might have the whole world hating you. Sign me up. <laughs> you don't start with that, by the way. But when you sign up for this, you believe in Christ, it may happen, and it may not. Most of my life as a Christian, and over 25 years has been as a teacher, by far the majority has been, thank you for your message today. And I've gone into prisons for 20 years to preach, and most of those guys have been very thankful. Uh, other parts of the world, even here now, but especially other parts of the world, if you even have a Bible, you might die. If you don't believe in Jesus and you're a Jew that has the Old Testament, you might die. 
They hate the Judeo-Christian ethic. Our country was built on it, and they despise it. Many do. They just hate the Word of God. So, 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And when I say they, they're unbelievers ruled by Satan who persecute the people of God. So the apostles suffered for their faith, right? Remember, after the church begins, they're taking the message out and taking the gospel of Christ out. It started in Jerusalem, so it's among the Jewish people. Then it'll eventually get to Cornelius in Acts 10, going out to the Gentiles. Paul will be the apostle to the Gentiles. But early in Acts, they're really going through it. Remember, the the apostles are preaching their faith, and um, they have... uh, the religious leaders take hold of the apostles and they had this little meeting of what to do with them. And remember Gamaliel says, be careful what you do with these men. If it's not of God, it'll disperse. But if it's of God, you'll just be fighting God. So they took his advice, Acts 5, 40 and 41. And after calling the apostles in, they flogged them. Okay, we're not going to kill you, but we'll give you a good beating. Ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. So they went on their way. Look at this attitude. From the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now that's an attitude of maturity. Acts 16, 22. The crowds rose up together against them. Remember uh, Paul and Silas? And the chief magistrates tore their robes off of them, proceeded them to be beaten with rods. And where'd they end up? In jail. And who came to faith that day or in that time? The Philippian jailer, the famous, what shall I do to be saved? And the apostles said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Ah, suffering can bring glory to God and bring somebody to Christ. And by the way, Paul and Silas were not complaining in prison. It says they were put in stocks in the middle of the prison and the doors are locked. Of course, the earthquake comes, opens, the stocks fall off, the the gates of the prison open up, the Philippian jailer runs in thinking the prisoners are gone, so he pulls out a knife to kill himself because he knows the Romans will do that if he let them go. And they're like, no, 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 we're still here. And uh, well, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Stephen, remember Acts 7, didn't get any better. He, they put him to death. A Jewish man named Stephen, read Acts 7, it's amazing. He masterfully goes through parts of Torah and forward, uh, spends a lot of time in Torah with Moses and that uh, Exodus generation. Um, even goes back to Abraham at the beginning of, the, of his message. And then he keeps moving toward Christ. And then he said, he's the one that Moses predicted that you guys killed. And, of course, they stoned Stephen. That, that upset them so bad. They loved his Old Testament preaching until he, he compared it to Jesus. So now they, they stone him to death. And remember his last words before he died, Acts 7, verse 60? Falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice as they're stoning him, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep, which means he physically died. Of course, Jesus was standing at the right hand of God, honoring his death. Um, Doesn't that reflect Christ? Because when Jesus was dying on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Luke 23, 34. So he's reflecting his Lord in his suffering. Not the same kind of suffering but bad enough. Old Testament heroes suffered for their faith, what we would call the by, the by faith hall of fame, it's been called. So you'll read Hebrews 11, a very Jewish book, and the writer that's unnamed goes through a list of Old Testament saints, Moses, Sarah, Abraham, um, he, he, uh, who else is he really? He hits Moses quite a bit. Um, And then he goes through this list of those who, by faith, did wonderful things for God. And then he does this in 11. You go to Hebrews 11. And start in verse 32, because the chapter gets long, and now he starts to summarize the sufferings of those of the Old Testament. In verse 32, and what more shall I say? 
For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson. Now he's in the period of the judges, isn't he? Jephthah of David. We've just been studying First and Second Samuel, almost done with those two books. And Samuel and the prophets. Boy, he just kind of and the prophets. How many are, are those? Quite a few. Who, all these men, by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the judge, the, excuse me, the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, accepting, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. Some argue Isaiah was. They were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated. So suffering for our faith. As we start to wind this up, believers during the church age are called to suffer even to the point of death. That was the opening scripture reading. Revelation 2.10, I think Revelations chapters 2 and 3. Revelation 2 and 3 is dealing with the church on earth, the seven churches of Asia Minor. It says, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. Uh, remember Mark had the adversary in that translation. It's Diabolos, the devil. Satanas is Satan. The Hebrew Satan means adversary. Um, he's about to cast some of you into prison so you'll be tested and you'll have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death. I don't think just simply means be faithful till whenever you die. I think it's be faithful to the point of death and martyrdom. And I'll give you the crown of life, which is a reward for faithfulness. And then how many things have we seen in our study of the tribulation, the seven-year period that's still future, recorded in Revelation 6 through 19, 19 being the return of Christ on the white horse to remove uh, the enemies of Israel. Over and over we've seen this, so I'll be very brief here. Remember, Jesus predicted the suffering of this time. Then they'll deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. He's talking about that seven-year period before his um, return to earth. Some will say it's the last half. But that time period will have great death. They will be murdered. And you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. So here are those references. I think we just read them a few weeks ago, so I'll just give you the references. The seven-year tribulation reveals a multitude of examples of persecution and suffering of God's people. Revelation 6, 9 through 11, remember the martyrs that are under the altar? When are you going to avenge our blood? Revelation 7, 9 through 15, Revelation chapter 13, the woman, Israel, being persecuted by Satan. Revelation 16, 5 and 6, 17, 6. Revelation 18, 24, Revelation 20, verse 4. Remember, those who had been beheaded for Christ were brought to life. So they were ex executed by the Antichrist. So I want to I close before we take communion with a quote from Dr. William L. Craig. Uh, and this was from a debate platform that had speakers who were Christian and non-Christian. And they were debating the meaning of life and suffering and all of this. I, I would not want to debate William L. Craig just because he's so polished as a debater. He could probably take any side of the debate and beat somebody. Um, but he does take the Christian worldview. <clears throat> and he said this. One of the reasons we find the idea of suffering so intractable is because we're often nat we often naturally assume that if God exists, then his purpose in life for us must be human happiness in this life with suffering and pain not seeming to contribute to that end. But in a Christian worldview, that assumption is false. The purpose in life is not human happiness as such, 
but rather the knowledge of God, which in the end will lead to the ultimate human fulfillment and happiness. We constantly need to keep in mind that God's purposes in life are much broader than what is merely conducive to our happiness, but that His ultimate purpose is to establish the kingdom of God, and what we suffer should always be seen in light of that greater overarching purpose. Our suffering should also be seen in light of the cross. God shows us in the cross that He is not some distant and personal being who cruelly sits by and watches us suffer. When we go through intense suffering and say, where is God? We ought to point them to the cross and say, there is God. God is a God who enters into our world of suffering and took the whole took upon himself the unimaginable suffering of bearing the penalty of the sins of the whole world, even though he was completely innocent. And the prophecy of Isaiah 53 teaches that. He knew no sin. He was like a sheep before the shears that is silent, but he would bear our iniquities. So if anyone could complain of unjust suffering, it would be Jesus of Nazareth. And though he was innocent, he took upon himself the death penalty of sin that you and I deserve. Therefore, when seen in the light of the cross, the problem of evil takes on an entirely different perspective. When we see the suffering of Jesus, we realize that the problem is not how God can justify himself to us, but the problem is how I, filled with wickedness and sin and guilt before God, can be justified before him. And I believe as we look at the cross, we can say to ourselves as we go through times of suffering, if God would go to the extent of what he did for us at the cross and his love would carry him to those depths for me, then surely out of my love for him, I can bear this burden that he has asked me to bear through this short life I'm enduring now. Amen. Father in heaven, we just thank you for this study on suffering, and may we have that eternal perspective that helps us go through what you call light and momentary affliction. Oh, Lord, we thank you that it's only momentary and will one day be in a kingdom of no more tears, no more pain, no more death. The old things have passed away. And we know it can only be light if we look at it from the perspective of eternity and what your son has done for us. And we'll ask for this perspective in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now we turn to the Lord's table, our focus on that particular celebration. So if you'll turn with me to Luke 22. By the way, did everybody get elements? Reggie is standing in the back. If anyone still needs them. And let's turn and just read quickly verse, or Luke 22, 14 and following. We always introduce with it. come, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Again, the Passover celebration instituted from Exodus 12. For I say to you, I shall never eat of it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Referring back to Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, the new covenant that had to be ratified through the blood sacrifice of a substitute for the sins of the world, which is Jesus Christ. So we, we've come together to worship the Lord and to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us in the past at the cross as we anticipate His imminent return for us in the future. So we always start with the bread. We take a few moments to pray and, and think about our Lord. Um, so we'll do that for a few moments and then uh, you might as well get the, uh, the cup prepared and take, get ready to take the bread. We'll take it all together here in a few moments. I want to read a passage from Isaiah first.
Isaiah 53 says, He was wounded for our transgressions and was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall on Him. So the unleavened bread we eat in the celebration of the Lord's table represents the impeccability of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect sinless sacrifice for the sins of man. We are the sinners, therefore it required a sinless sacrifice. God must become flesh. And he did, and he bore our sins in his own body on the cross. So when Jesus went to the cross, the Father did pour out all of the sins of the world on mankind, and he was judged as our substitute, which now makes all men savable because the, the payment has been made for our sin. But one must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So, the night before his death, the Lord Jesus Christ took the bread and said, this is my body, which is given as a substitute for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread and eat. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you so much for our celebration of our Lord and what he's done on the cross. And we thank you that you did provide a sinless sacrifice, one that was qualified. And we'll thank you for all eternity in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's prepare the cup and then take a few moments of silent prayer and then we'll take the cup together. First Peter chapter 1 says, If you call on the Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as a lamb unblemished and spotless, picking up on the lamb from Exodus 12, the Passover lamb, as well as the Lamb of Isaiah 53. But with precious blood is a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So the cup that we drink during the Lord's Supper represents the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, His redemption payment as our substitute on the cross for our sins. So on that same night before His death, the Lord Jesus took the cup and said, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let us take and drink. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for our celebration of you today. 
centered around your son who made it all possible. So, Lord, we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice that was made for us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who bore our sins in his own body, and through his blood we have eternal life. So, Father, we thank you, and it'll be something we'll remember for all eternity, and it'll be the central reason, the only reason. We are in your presence forever. So we thank you today and tomorrow and forever in Jesus' name. Amen.